My name's Matt, and on today's episode of Lessons I've Learned, I have writer, performer, activist, um, snake owner, tamer, person who I first experienced my love of car washes with, Christian Liu. Christian, how are you today? Hi, Matt. I am good. Very good. I have no power in my bedroom. Um... We have experienced a partial uh, a partial blackout in my apartment. And when you say uh, in your apartment, you mean just in your apartment, not in New York City as a whole, just your apartment. Just my apartment. Uh, me, my roommate and I blew a fuse yesterday, and my super is not going to fix it for a little bit. Um, did, you, did you threaten him with your snake? Um, he actually doesn't know that we have a <laughs> snake. <laughs> yesterday when he came by um i was like <laughs> i was like trying to like keep the snake for him so i i had i had my snake like sitting in my sweatshirt while i was like talking to him <laughs> i mean i guess a snake is gonna be easier to hide than like a, a dog or a cat or something like that yeah for mm-hmm. sure i mean like i think that my super like comes into my apartment not really expecting a smell so like if it smells like snake poop it's like um okay christian so i so the first question that i have for you is what is the first ever lesson that you remember learning the first ever like the first moral like lesson just like learning? the first lesson in general it could be that you touched the stove and it was hot so you like took your hand off of it like just um, anything in general i think that the first lesson i ever learned that i remember learning was like um I guess like really early on like in elementary school I remember learning that like like talk like hanging out with a teacher is like an option (laughs) and I was like definitely one of those kids that was like oh yeah everyone's at recess do you want me to like organize some books for you (laughs) (laughs) no you uh you grew up in in um in uh Texas right Yep, Garland, Texas. So did you guys have, um, I know that in Oklahoma, well, at, at least at Hera, um, we had like the student aid options, like as you went higher um, in the school, like in like junior high to high school, you could be like a librarian aide, you could be an office aide. Were you one of those kids? No, I wasn't. I, um, I was really, really trying to like work extracurriculars into my day. So like, being like a being like a student aide was not like something that I wanted to do. Also, it like didn't count for credit, and I was like, "Come on, work smarter, not harder, people." Wait, so they would have you? So you you could have a class, but it wouldn't count as a credit? Well, yeah, like if you do like student aid or something, like I mean, I guess you can put it on your on your like resume or something, but like you can't like, I mean, it doesn't count for any kind of credit. Oh, okay, okay. okay. I see what you're saying now. Okay. Were you, um, so like what extracurriculars were you doing? Um, well, I was, um, uh, famously in choir. Okay. Um, less famously, uh, auditioned for one musical in high school. It was how to succeed. I had to drop out because my dad was like, you don't have time for this. And then, um, uh, that was really awkward conversation that I had had to have with like seven people. Um, How many rehearsals had you gotten into the show? Um, I think the cast list had come out, and I was in the ensemble. And you were like, and "I'm in the ensemble." I, I, I no, I'm sorry. I no, 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 no. I love being in the ensemble. No, <laughs> You're like, um, I just don't have time. I'm really, okay. really big, guys. No, 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 no. Um, it was not like that. Um, I. But, but I was also trying to do swim team, and I was I was the slowest person on the swim team. But um, that is okay. So you it is so you were doing choir, swim, attempting to do a musical. Like what were you like? When when did you have? I free time? was also doing academic decathlon. <laughs> I was also doing. Um, I was also doing uh, a program called FTS uh-huh. or FTI. Um, which was, like, a future teacher's okay. program. So, like, I would go, like, a couple times a month to, like, a third grade class and, like, do a lesson. Okay. Um, and 
Uh, I was also, I'm trying to think of what else I did. What type of lessons were you like teaching? I liked to teach science. Okay. Um, I would love to have been able to do music, but, um, it was more, it was less, it was more of like a, can you like be an elementary school teacher? Not can you be an elementary school music teacher? Got it. Okay. Got it. Um, yeah. So would you say that your dad was right in his, you probably don't have time to do this. Um, I'm going to say no, because I like probably could have gone like, I don't know. I think that if I had started theater earlier than mm-hmm. I did, because I didn't, I didn't really start acting until I was like 20. Okay. Um, and I was already like in college for a significant amount of time. And, um, so I think that if I had like done it all through high school, like I would have been like hot Jimmy Awards material. Like I would have been... I would have been Ava Noble Zada so in, level. So anyone that does not know what the Jimmy Awards are, the Jimmy Awards are like a high school musical theater award type yeah. of thing. Um, it's like it's like the Tonys, but like with real with real stakes. <laughs> um, so you so you auditioned for how to succeed in high school. What what year of your high school year would that have been? I think that was maybe ninth or 10th grade. Okay. And how long had you been doing choir up to that point? I had been doing choir all through middle school. Okay. And I did it for a couple years in high school, but I had to stop because I wanted to do other things. Okay. And then I transferred schools and then I graduated early. It was a big mess. So you, um, so you, from a, from a younger age, you decided that you wanted to at least have some sort of singing experience or you wanted to pursue singing at least to some sorts um when did you decide that you wanted to carry that over into musical theater like when did those lines sort of start to overlap um I would say that I I had like always been like interested I think you know you probably understand the experience of like being at like lower levels of educational theater and people like struggling to find boys to play parts (laughs) Um, uh, so that was always like, I guess it was like always an option. Mm -hmm. Um, I had never really thought of it. Um, I mean, I also did like a very, um, actually, I'm not going to mention it. (laughs) We, we are, you are never going to know. Um, and I think. Is it because it's, 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 it's something that you're ashamed of or it's too embarrassing? Like where, where does it fall in? It's not really shame. I mean, it's shameful now because it was like, I really just like had no talent. (laughs) (laughs) And also it was like, okay, I can't say too much without giving it away. Um, But I I, I was just like, I was just like not really into the experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like, it was like fun, but was it? And then it was like, I don't know. It also planted the seed of like being, having a career in theater is about conformity. Got it. Idea to me. Do you, so as you graduated high school, where did you go before you went to UCO? I went to a hot community college called uh, Collin College, okay. formerly known as Collin County Community College. Collin County Community. Okay. Got it. Quad C, which is famously the place to be. So when you were at Colin, Collins College or Collin College? Just Collin College. Because okay. it's like the name of the county. It's not like I got it. Okay, got it. So whenever you were at Collin College, did you, um, was that sort of where you sort of started to think about musical theater? Or what was the step like going from there to UCO where you pursued musical theater? Yes. I was having like pretty significant like mental health issues Mm -hmm. and then um one of my friends was like oh you should like do this and I was like okay do this being being part of a show um I believe I believe I was part of a show first or perhaps I there's a class that I may have taken before auditioning for that show but that show was ragtime okay and I was in the ensemble and I um (laughs) I I was like uh I I I I had to be the guy who said um 
that 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 slur um not the not the not the not the slur for um black folks but the slur for irish folks at what point in the show does that happen uh it happens during toll house demands okay and he's like you gosh darn gutless okay um, <laughs> um it's uh it I, 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 I like always like cringe at myself because it just doesn't feel natural coming out of my mouth. For sure. And like I guess that's I guess that's what acting is, but uh I'm uh I'm I'm famously bad at that. You're famously bad at acting, is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> um I mean think about it, like I even even at my best, even at my best, I'm like a singer who talks. Ridiculous. I'm not, like, Ridiculous. I'm like like a singer who like speaks dialogue so you, okay so you were at colin doing ragtime um mm-hmm. your friend sort of helped you um and gave you some advice during a hard time in your life um as you were like sort of working through stuff and so then what made you decide to pursue musical theater um at uco well I got after that show and then after a couple of semesters of like really um like like a- applying myself um as as like an actor or whatever I'm um, like doing the training taking classes um I was like yeah okay I'm going to do this as a career and um then uh North Texas Drama Auditions which is hosted at Collin College. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's like one of the, I mean, I guess it's like, it's like SETC, NETC, Straw Hat situation. Okay. But for colleges. um, And those are, um, you would say those are sort of cattle call auditions. Yes. Rounding up a lot of people in order to be, in order for these universities and places to see a lot of people in a condensed area. Yes. Yes. Um, So, there was one year where I was working that I was working North Texas drama auditions. Um, it was really, really fun. And then I, wait, I think I only did it one year. Okay. So I worked it. And then I also, um, like did my 90 seconds, um, which was fun. And, um, I got, I I got, I got, I got a surprising amount of attention. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I ended up going to UCL um and so when you were at uco i know that there um that during the program that you at one point um did a one-man show and so what sort of what sort of went through your head to sort of create this performance opportunity for yourself well so because uh because I look the way I look, um, I, uh, it, 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 it's simply a fact that, like, within the world of commercial theater, like, there are less job opportunities for people who look like me, um, which is fine. Um, if you're, if you can't see me right now, um, I'm, like, a fat Asian trans person, um, and that is all very well and good with me, um, but it's not very well and good with Rodgers and Hammerstein. <laughs> so, um, well, okay. So, okay. So, so a question on that: Would you say that it's necessarily Rodgers and Hammerstein, or people that are casting Rodgers and Hammerstein? I definitely think that in a contemporary conversation where we're talking about like per- the current job landscape, I think a lot of that falls on casting, but it also falls on. I mean, it's, like, casting is only one part of, like, a larger machine that is, um, you know, systemic racism or whatever. Um, so in that regard, you know, I, I would love to, I would love to, um, be one of those people who's, like, oh, trailblazing, like, I'm, I'm doing the, like, Anne Harada thing or whatever, um, but, uh, I mean, it's just that, like, it's a lot of work to be a trailblazer. <laughs> and I just, like, don't have that in me. 
<laughs> so you so because of those sort of restricted opportunities, that was one thing that sort of fueled you to go down this route of creating your show. Yeah, it was like I just want to like do this for me. I just want to sing the songs that I want to sing, and I want to like do like what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember that semester. Um, <laughs> There was a, actually it wasn't that semester, it was the next year, I believe, Mm -hmm. where uh, I was speaking to one of those faculty members, and I was like, listen, am I going to be, like, do I have a shot at being cast in the show, Mm -hmm. or should I just, can I just, like, do my own thing, and not waste my time with, like, even doing this stupid little audition, because I'm, like, you know, it doesn't matter that I'm like, like, I already know how to audition. I don't, I need a, I need to do something. I want to do, I want to be busy. For sure. And this professor <laughs> was like, oh, I totally understand where you're coming from. And you're crazy for thinking that because we have no bias at all at this school. And in fact, people are, people, I, I have experienced prejudice in casting too, because I am redacted physical trait <laughs> that is not the same at all as being uh like racially discriminated mm-hmm. against in casting this faculty member was like oh i'm so redacted that like you know it's hard for me to get cast too <laughs> and i'm like okay that's not really the same thing right um but I left that conversation and I was like I guess I'm crazy (laughs) Um, so how do you as a performer sort of um walk like walk this reality realizing that you want to perform but also there may not be as many opportunities for you because of something that you have no control over so yeah actually that is why I've largely moved away from commercial theater. Mm-hmm. When you say and commercial theater, what would be the other types of theater? Um, other types of theater would be like, um, you know, uh, contemporary opera, okay. like more experimental theater, like so. If you were so, the Lion King on works. Broadway, you would say that would be commercial theater. Yeah, okay. that Broadway is like um, Broadway is famously like the most commercial. Theater. Right. Okay, but you know any 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 kind of theater where you're um, like licensing and performing like famous works of musical theater. Okay. Um, it, so like even even like you know smaller like local theaters um, are you know a part of the commercial commercial theater like machine i don't know i keep yeah I keep no describing things as machines that makes sense. no yeah <laughs> that makes sense um and so the more i was up here in new york like auditioning not really getting stuff and then realizing that the stuff that i was getting was like not really the kind of work that i want to do um I started doing comedy by you know doing stand up mm-hmm. Um, I started doing more writing. Um, not that my dream is to be like Lynn manuel Miranda and like writing work just so that I can be in it. Um, which is like, not to say that that's not valid. Like, obviously, like, good for you. Right. But um, God, he like doesn't need my approval. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I've got like, I've got so many awards. I think he's like, um, I actually to told him that. that you were going to be on this podcast and he said he was really looking yeah. forward to this episode. So. Does, does he have does he have an EGOT yet? Um, I think the only one that he doesn't have is uh, an Oscar. Does he have? An... He has an Oscar for no. He doesn't have an Oscar because he lost Moana. Does he wait. have? Oh wait, or does he not have an Emmy? He definitely has an Emmy. See, I I don't know. I don't, I'm not I'm not gonna talk. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> he has what they call a McPigot. Oh. Which is, <laughs> Which is a MacArthur Fellowship, okay, <laughs> a Pulitzer Prize, okay, um, an Emmy, a Grammy, uh, a Tony, and oh, I guess he doesn't have an Oscar. Wait, Academy Award, but he's already he's already had a Kennedy Center honor. I mean, we need to we need to just get him that Oscar. 
We can just we need to get him that can, Oscar. Yeah. I mean, it's like come on. You Hope go from not giving little. him your approval to being on the board of representatives to get Lin Manuel Miranda an Oscar. Yeah. So now, now comedy is primarily what I do. Um, I still like to do theater, um, but it's more like I don't know. I'm still I'm I'm doing theater mostly like for the love of the sport for sure. Um, which is. Yeah, it's nice. And, you know, I, I, I've always been more that kind of performer anyways. Like, even when I am doing musical theater, like, I'm doing those kind of, like, comic relief, like, ka 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 roles. Um, so it seems like a natural progression for me. Um, and it, it's actually really common for, like, former actors to be comedians. So it's, like, I'm not special in that regard. <laughs> Would you say that doing... Um that going to school for theater and going to school for performing and like practicing entertaining um, to potentially do that as your profession, what would you say that those things sort of taught you or like what's something that you learned about yourself during that process? I mean, I think definitely if there was like uh, a a most valuable skill that you can learn um, from like theater school that translates to like doing comedy is like it's about physical presence really um like i i i I don't think that you have to be like ah in order to be like a good comedian but um just like having that like sense of like what the character is (laughs) um because you know like most of the time comedians are not like actually like putting their real real like regular person thoughts on stage they're Mm -hmm. like you know making jokes yeah for sure if you call it that (laughs) i mean sometimes sometimes um um would you where would would you say that you um are enjoying doing comedy more than when you were acting yeah um I have to admit that comedy is really fulfilling because um, acting is like interpretive Mm -hmm. and comedy usually is generative. Um, And so it's really rewarding to, um, I guess it's rewarding in a different way. Um, It's it's really rewarding to generate the work and have people's responses to it. And, you know, that just feels so much more, um, gratifying than mm-hmm. like doing um whatever a funny thing happened on the way to the forum you know for sure um oh. w- do you ever find yourself sort of taking lessons that you learn sort of talking about the physical presence thing like do you ever find yourself taking what you learn in your voice lessons and applying that to a comedy routine like what are some things that you do sort of in that aspect well uh this piece right now that i'm working on um at my ars nova fellowship um is largely connected to like all of those things that uh i learned in college Mm -hmm. that i feel like are like you know perfectly ripe skills for comedy but like you know uh are not necessarily things that people do all the time. Like, um, I, uh, I, I've, I've written a couple of things where, you know, it, it's like, um, you know, like my character or my character, I, I, it's like a sketch where I'm, I'm like doing a fictionalized thing. And then like, I, I suddenly go into my, I want song or like, I, um, I'm like singing a song and then like, super titles above my head like are saying what i'm really thinking got it or um you know like uh, i i'm i'm really i'm really uh i'm really hell bound to incorporate uh, some kind of dance into this uh piece just because it's like i don't know i feel like i was like <clears throat> not okay not to be like not to be like ha 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 annoying about it but i think it's like it's funny when people do something like poorly to be funny, but I think also there's like something really hilarious about like someone doing like someone, someone like dancing around it like really well. 
Got it. Yeah, and, like, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Yeah. It's and obviously I'm not I saying like I'm I'm a really good dancer, but like I am I, I don't know. I think that there are a lot of times when like some high profile person will do like, you know, a time step and mm-hmm. it's like, ah um you know, it's like throwing <laughs> some wings. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're saying, yeah. So what sort of got you down this writing avenue? Well, for stand-up, you have to write your own material. I mean, otherwise you're like a thief. Um, or, or, you, or you're a hack, um, as they say. Um, so I was already kind of building those soft skills, and then um, I started writing sketch and satire, which um, I think I think having a background in theater helps with sketch at least um, because you know you set up situations and then you fulfill them in a way that is like theatrically mm-hmm. like pretty standard um, and um, with satire it's more I don't know I'm, I I I tend to be a very sarcastic person. And, like, that kind of, like, dry humor is, like, very much up my alley. So Mm -hmm. satire and I are just, like, very natural. And then do you... So, but you also are a freelance writer as well, correct? I am also a freelance writer as well. And I think that doing satire really just, like, opened me up to the possibilities of, like, oh, like it's someone's job to write like everything on the internet and like I could be one of those people. Absolutely. What do you, um, what do you like writing for most? Like out of the writing avenues that you've talked about, what's your favorite one to write for? I mean, I think that the thing that comes pretty naturally to me that like I haven't really had that much like professional experience in so like maybe it's bad (laughs) but uh, I really I really like um doing like uh like sort of critical think pieces on media okay um and so like there are a lot of things that like I just I I don't have published that are like my thoughts about like whatever cartoon I've been watching yeah um and so um you know, I just like, I. it's really nice to be able to, like, break something down narratively and, like, really kind of, like, explore, like, what what that really means, like, in art, especially with animation, mm-hmm. because there's so, I don't know, animation is such a flexible um, storytelling tool, mm-hmm. like, uh, between, like, say, um, like, Steven Universe, right. which I'm wearing Steven Universe right. shirt right now, um, <laughs> And um, I just finished watching Teen Titans again. Okay, the and, like, original Teen Titans. Yes. Okay. Um, and it is. I mean, it's like incredible the way that something can go from like such a like silly, like absurdist mood mm-hmm. to being like high stakes, like life and death. Absolutely. Like, um, like battle of wills and morals. Steven Universe <laughs> um, is, is is fantastic. Fantastic. It's, it's uh, right now, actually, I'm working my way through Yu Yu Hakusho, which okay. is an old action anime. Okay. Um, and it is heating up. Like it is, it is heating up in 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 a way that only like an action anime can. Like there are so many, so many fights that end in mutually assured destruction. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What would you say is your favorite? Um, as far as like watching a piece of media or um partaking in a piece of media whether it be like a podcast or a book or a movie or a tv show or a cartoon or whatever um what would you say is your favorite piece of media to sort of like partake in and then sort of like break it down and think about it um hmm like a specific piece across any platform um i would say probably um I'd say probably like mm, probably like this is hard. Um okay, okay, okay. Like a specific piece right now I would love to be I would love to be talking about Hilda, okay. which is um 
a cartoon that is on Netflix about a little girl who grows up in the woods and has to move to the city with her mom. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just like really, it's really interesting. It's really beautiful. Um, It's very like after school specialty, but um, in a way that's like really satisfying to watch because um, the, the main character is like, like full of empathy and um, the, the people around her, are not necessarily like um they're not necessarily like evil they just like don't really understand like their own impact so in that regard it's like a big um it's a a big parallel to um like humans impact on the environment Mm -hmm. and like um how like we create situations where like we're using up all of our resources and creating inhospitable environments um and um yeah it's really nice very um very like uh like ghibli kind of storytelling Mm -hmm. where there's not necessarily like a bad guy Mm -hmm. it's just like a situation where like people need to like grow and like learn empathy to understand Mm -hmm. and and Um, you said it's called uh, it's it's called um hilda hilda okay hilda um it's like cartoon with a little girl she's got blue hair very cute very um cool. highly recommend so i know um i will say recently but i don't know how recent it is as far as like your experience goes but i know that we were having a conversation several months back and um you were sort of talking about your experience coming out as trans and so what um what has that been like where did that sort of discovery or like when did that discovery sort of happen and um would you say that it was coming out like what what was that whole experience for you like uh I think in terms of I mean obviously obviously the most important person for you to come out to is yourself absolutely (laughs) um so I uh I love I love that I have been able to, especially over the last year, um, been able to explore like what my actual relationship is with gender um, instead of what I think I've been like conditioned to understand as my mm-hmm. relationship to gender. Um, like truly, I feel like we are taught that like gender is something that like you something like intangible that like rules like our entire life but actually like i've found that gender is like a really beautiful tool of like self-expression um in a way that is almost brought me closer to um like my spirituality Mm -hmm. than i had ever even thought was possible Um, so in that regard, um, I'm non-binary and, um, you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm a non-binary person who doesn't really feel like I want to take any steps to transition, um, medically. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, not much about my everyday life has changed. I mean, there are more things that I allow myself to do. And there are more things that I allow myself to let go of. And that is like, I'm able to define that every day. And that's like lit. What? As it were. um, So what is a description that you would give of what it means to be non-binary to somebody um, that's just sort of like a surf, not a, not a surface level description, but sort of like a a high level description. Okay, the I mean the best the best way that I can describe the experience of realizing that you're non-binary is um, in the movie Frozen Two, <laughs> when Elsa is like off on her own. She's like um she's like riding the horse across the ocean and then she like sings show yourself Mm -hmm. and she like goes through that process of like realizing that the person that she's looking for was actually her Mm -hmm. all the the whole time it's like that's non-binary and so um go go ahead i i I was gonna say um i mean like another thing that's like very non-binary is um 
you know, Rachel Weiss in yeah. The Favorite. Okay. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. What, um, what is the yeah. difference between non-binary and gender fluid? Um, so non-binary, much like transgender, is kind of an umbrella term. Okay. Um, basically, a lot of people think of, you know, male, female, non-binary as like three gender options. Mm-hmm. And actually, um, non-binary is more of a... It's more of an umbrella term because, like, you know, if you're male, you can be a cis male or a trans male. Mm-hmm. You, if you're female, you could be a cis female or a trans female. But if you're non-binary, you can be one of many things that may or may not have yet to be defined. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so for me, I mean, like, I could go for days on end describing what my gender is, like, just in, like, animation visuals. But... Um, <laughs> I think that for simplicity's sake, it's like I'm an enigma and you cannot hope to understand me fully, which is like sick. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think that there's something, I mean, there's some, there, there is a concept called the divine alchemy of self, mm-hmm. which is, uh, it describes the experience that trans people go through, like building their identity and, um yeah i mean it, it's 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 truly like the best way to understand yourself on like a soul level mm-hmm. like but then at the same time it's like it's like i'm so relaxed about it you know what i mean yeah it's like oh like this feels so natural what um what is something that since you have discovered this color of yourself, like what is something that you're now learning about yourself since you have discovered this aspect of you and sort of like opened up this door? What is a lesson that you learn now beyond that door? Um, I'm learning that my, uh, my style is not really what I thought it was like, I really like style meaning clothes or style meaning s- style meaning like yeah like clothes and then like also like cosmetics and things mm-hmm. um I'm like learning more and more that like I'm not really 